Hey, what's up? I'm John Davey. I work in IT and I used to be a tech instructor. I'm also a cybersecurity career ambassador for the National Institute for Cybersecurity Education. Recently, I've been tutoring people looking for help with passing the Security Plus exam. So I figured I should share my exam question breakdowns. So let's jump right into it. Question one, a biotech firm is experiencing problems with intellectual property being sent to a competitor from its system. The transfer info follows an identifiable pattern rather than being random. Which of the following should be implemented in the system to stop the content from being sent? Encryption, hashing, IPS or DLP? Let's look at the wrong answers first. Encryption protects data by converting it into a code to prevent people from viewing it. This is a good security measure, but it's just not the right one. The question is looking for a solution that stops data from being sent out of the system. Encryption camouflages the data. It doesn't prevent the transfer of data. Hashing is the process of converting data into a unique code of letters and numbers. This data can be a password or a file. For example, you may have heard about hashing a downloaded installation file. The reason why you want to do this is to make sure that the file is safe and hasn't been tampered with, confirming it's the real software from the vendor. For example, let's say you download a new Linux OS to be installed on a virtual machine. Hashing in this scenario involves taking the OS downloaded file and running it through a hashing algorithm to produce a fixed size string of characters, which is typically a hexadecimal number. Hexadecimal characters include any number from 0 to 9 and the letters A through F. This output is known as the hash value or hash digest. Once you have the hash value of the downloaded file, you'll compare it with the hash value provided by the software provider. If the hash values match, it means the file you downloaded is exactly the same as the file that the software provider published. You can proceed with installing the OS without worrying about the file being corrupted or infected with malware. This is good for data integrity, but this doesn't answer the question. The question asks what will stop the data from being sent, not what will confirm the integrity of the data being sent. IPS stands for the Intrusion Prevention System. It's a tool used to automatically monitor network traffic for suspicious activity and can even prevent some attacks. Intrusion Prevention Systems analyze network traffic and compare it against signatures in an internal database. If the traffic matches a pattern that indicates an attack, the IPS drops the packet and blocks further traffic from the attacker's IP address or port number. An IPS can block some malicious traffic, but it isn't designed to stop the intentional transfer of sensitive information that looks like normal data. It mainly detects and blocks known network-based attack signatures and anomalies, not specific patterns of data leaks. Okay, so now that we ruled out the wrong answers, let's look at why DLP is the correct answer. DLP systems are specifically designed to find and protect sensitive info like customer details or social security numbers. They can be configured to check the content of emails, files, and other data to ensure nothing sensitive gets out. If you look at the question, this line here, the transferred information follows an identifiable pattern rather than being random implies that someone in the organization is intentionally leaking intellectual property. Since there's a recognized pattern for the data being leaked, an endpoint DLP software can be installed on each employee's laptop or workstation to look for this type of activity. If the endpoint DLP finds the pattern it was programmed to look for, it can take action to prevent the data from being transmitted or accessed by unauthorized individuals. An example of a pattern can be if someone tries to email themselves a customer's social security number to their personal email account. The DLP system can spot this by looking for numbers in an email's text that matches the 3x-2x-4x social security number pattern. On to question two. 
and which risk management strategy would cybersecurity insurance be utilized? Transference, avoidance, acceptance, or mitigation? Let's increase the odds of picking the right answer by ruling out as many of the wrong ones first. Risk avoidance in cybersecurity involves completely eliminating certain risks by not engaging in activities or using certain technologies that could expose vulnerabilities. A company might decide not to use a certain piece of software known to have vulnerabilities, even if it's popular and widely used in the industry. For instance, if a web application framework has a history of security flaws and frequent patches, the company might choose to use a different, more secure framework or develop their own custom solution. This way, they completely avoid the risk associated with the suspect framework. For example, WordPress is probably the most popular content management system for websites. Because of this popularity, WordPress has been a frequent target for attackers. Due to the nature of its plugin system being highly dependent on third-party developers, it has had numerous vulnerabilities leading to regular updates and patches. Many of these vulnerabilities stem from third-party plugins and themes. Because of these vulnerabilities, an organization may decide to go with a less popular or even custom-built web application for its web development needs. In this scenario, the organization chose to avoid the risk of using WordPress for their website content management needs. Risk acceptance in cybersecurity is the decision to acknowledge and accept the presence of a risk without taking steps to mitigate or eliminate it. This approach is taken when the cost of addressing the risk is higher than the potential impact of the risk itself. An example of acceptance could be a small business that uses an old version of a customer relationship management software that has a couple of known security vulnerabilities. The cost to upgrade to a new version or switch to a different CRM system could be significant. The business assesses the situation and determines that because the CRM system contains non-critical data and it's only accessible within the internal network, the business decides to accept the risk associated with the old CRM software. They'll probably document the decision, continue to monitor the system for any signs of compromise, and plan for an upgrade in the future where the budget allows for it. Risk mitigation involves taking actions to reduce the impact or likelihood of a threat exploiting a vulnerability. The goal is to minimize the potential damage or prevent the threat from occurring. An example of risk mitigation could be if a company identifies that its employees are vulnerable to phishing attacks which could lead to malware infections or data breaches. To mitigate this risk, the organization could implement security awareness trainings and multi-factor authentication to help promote awareness of phishing attacks while adding an extra layer of security even if login credentials are compromised. By implementing these measures, the company significantly mitigates the likelihood and potential impact of phishing attacks. The three wrong answers, risk mitigation, risk acceptance, and risk avoidance focus on managing or eliminating the likelihood or impact of cybersecurity threats. However, they do not directly address the financial consequences of these threats. The correct answer is transference, and here's what I mean. By purchasing insurance, a business transfers some or all of the financial liabilities associated with data breaches or ransomware attacks to the insurance provider. The company still needs to implement cybersecurity measures, but the financial burden of a security incident is partially or fully transferred to the insurer. On to question three. Which command line tool should the security analysts utilize for the initial assessment of the company's DNS service configuration on the server? NSLOOKUP, TRACEROUTE, IPCONFIG, or NETSTAT? All four of these answers are Windows command prompt commands. When it comes to studying shell environment commands on this exam, your first goal is to know what's the general purpose of the command tool. The NETSTAT command is a Windows tool that shows you all the network connections your computer has open to the internet or other computers. 
You can use it to view all active connections, the routing table, and other pieces of data related to network activity. The trace route command is like a network diagnostic tool used on Windows systems to track the path packets take from your computer to a destination host, like a web server on a website. It helps you see each step along the way and can help you find where any delays or problems are happening. IP config is used to find out the current network settings like your computer's IP address, the subnet mask, the default gateway, and the network it's connected to. Now, if you use the IP config with the all switch, you can get some info about the DNS server your computer uses to get domain name info. But that's not the best tool to use to fully assess your company's DNS server configuration on the server. Based on these four options, you'll want to use NS Lookup. The NS Lookup command line tool is specifically designed for querying the domain name system to obtain domain name or IP address mapping info. Here's an example. Let's say you want to make sure that an email server was correctly configured by someone on your team. By using the NS lookup command, you can query mail exchange records, also known as MX records, to verify that the mail exchange servers for a domain are correctly configured. If there are issues with sending and receiving emails, checking the MX records can help determine if the problem is related to a DNS misconfiguration. And from a security perspective, you want to make sure the MX records point to legitimate mail servers, preventing email spoofing and phishing attacks. So let's go over an example of how to check the MX record of a domain using NS lookup in Windows. First, open command prompt or PowerShell. Then with just one command, type the following. NS lookup space hyphen query equals MX space example.com. Here's my output. In this example, mail.example.com and mail2.example.com are the mail servers for example.com. Hopefully, that's what the mail server should be. If not, then I've identified a DNS configuration error using the NS lookup tool. Remember, NS lookup can be used to ensure that email systems are correctly configured, troubleshoot email delivery issues, and maintain security against email related threats. By using NS Lookup, the security analyst can query the DNS server to retrieve info about the domain names, IP addresses, and other DNS records. This allows you to verify the accuracy of DNS configurations, check for any misconfigurations or inconsistencies, and ensure that the DNS service is functioning as expected. Make sure you're subscribed so you can get more Security Plus exam question breakdowns like this one. Also, did you notice how I started each question by eliminating the wrong answers first? My advice would be to get in the habit of ruling out the wrong answers first. There are times when you won't know why the right answer is the right answer, but you'll know what isn't the answer. For the actual exam, you can expect at least 10 questions where you pick an answer because you know the other options aren't the answer. There will also be times where you'll confidently get it down to two choices. You may not know which one is the right answer, but at least you have 50% chance of getting it right versus 1 out of 4 or 25%. Finally, taking the time to consistently rule out the wrong answers first will give you a steady approach that will help keep your anxiety down while taking the exam. Make sure you subscribe for more breakdowns and other resources to help you with your cybersecurity career goals. See you in the next video.